and uh, my son Bodhi is in the back. And yeah, okay. Um, so I am gonna be honest. I did not want to do this presentation. <laughs> like, really didn't want to. And I wanted to be here and I wanted to learn, uh, but I didn't want to do this. And for a few reasons. <laughs> but um, the, I. So I come from like a very conservative town in Ohio and a very conservative family and um, just grew up completely surrounded by people who would be laughing through this entire day, everything we've talked about. Well, no, they would not be here. So that's not, that's not relevant. But, um, but um, like would really ridicule all of these ideas. And um, somehow I had, I still kind of had this sense of justice growing up. Like I, uh, when I was in preschool, my Halloween costume was I dressed up like the, the mother in Mary Poppins who was, um, you know, fighting for votes for women. And um, so she was a suffragette. And uh, so I had that. And then um, my parents didn't let me know for a very long time that I was eating animals. And once I found out, I was trying to find some way to make that not happen. And as soon as I saw it, I heard, I had never heard of anyone not eating animals, but saw a movie and somebody was a vegetarian and that was it. I was like, okay, well, not eat. Somebody did that, it might be a movie, but whatever, I'm gonna look into that and, and do that. Um, even though there was no internet and there, uh, there were like two books in the library about vegetarianism. There was like just the definition of veganism and nothing else really in there. Um, but so, I just kind of figured out a few of those things on my own, but I did not have anyone in my life or any real exposure to any even slightly radical or even liberal ideas. Um, and so I am really behind and I'm, uh, you know, I've learned more in the last couple of years than I've learned in my whole life about this and I'm really trying to put a lot of things into practice, but I am not an academic. I have not studied any of this uh, for any thesis or anything like that. I mean, even the college I went to is in the middle of a cornfield and uh, where people, a lot of the people there had not met someone who was black, for example. Never met a black person. Um, they came from these tiny towns and they had only seen black people on TV. So, uh, really strange experience. So, I'm, anyway, I'm learning a lot. Yes. I never met a white person. <laughs> For real. No, I, I, I grew up around um, black, uh, black descendant um, Latinos, black, black descendant Latinos. Yeah. So I, I, I only saw a white person on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they would smile at you. Yeah. I mean, it is. So it goes up, it goes It goes both, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, yeah, it's and unfortunately it's still the case that we're um, positioned in places where we. Um, I've been thankful for the internet in that way that we get a little, little more diversity that way. But yeah. Um, so anyway, um, like I said, didn't want to do this um, because, because I'm I'm here to talk about ableism and speciesism and a little bit about capitalism and I'm an ableist and a speciesist and a capitalist. So. <laughs> you know, um, so it's kind of strange talking about this, but I am working on this, um, and it was good that I had to do this because it forced me to um, do a little extra work, particularly in ableism. I've been doing a lot of work with speciesism in the last several years. Not enough with ableism, which is strange because um, my son has autism, and I teach, not all, but many of my students have um, different abilities or they're disabled, and I have my own disabilities, all you know, that I'm mildly impacted by. Um, and but I didn't have a lot of exposure growing up. And then when my son was diagnosed with autism, I was surrounded only by um, parents who were going through this significant grieving process that they talked about, um, like you know, as if their child had died when they found out that they got this autism diagnosis. Um, so there was this grieving and then there was this huge push for a cure or everything we could possibly do beyond a cure. Every, you know, spend many, many thousands of dollars doing all kinds of therapies to 
do whatever you can to help them be as normal as possible. And um, the, so that was my whole surrounding. Every once in a while, we ran in, I ran into somebody who said, we, we don't need to cure autism. And, um, but it was always somebody who um, had you know, a high-functioning aut um, autistic child. Um, by the way, I'll say, sometimes I'll say child with autism and sometimes autistic child because people I've talked to with autism, some of them prefer one and some prefer the other. So um, anyway, they, um, they, the, uh, they often would talk about things like, well, Einstein probably had autism and if we cured him, then we wouldn't have had all of those um, scientific discoveries and we wouldn't have had all of that that he accomplished. And when I heard that, you know, being Bodhi's parent, I thought, well, you know, that's great for them, but he, you know, is, is nonverbal, he can't use the restroom by himself, can't do a bunch of these things, and, and, and many times he's in pain, he has digestive problems, he's like, especially, he's doing much better now, but at times he was like really miserable a lot of the time, and I thought, you know, I stop saying you don't want to cure her because you know, it's a very different um, situation for my son. That's where I was uh, feeling at that time. I, I'm feeling differently now, and I um, go back and forth for, with a lot of things. Um, but anyway, oh, so here's examples of me being a uh, speciesist and ableist and capitalist. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Bodhi, I never tell people this because it's just a horrible thing to say, but Bodhi really doesn't like a lot of non-human animals. He's very uncomfortable with them. He, he's scared of a lot of them, and in some cases he's had good reason to be, and um, he's allergic to some of them, and um, he's even ones we wouldn't typically be consider scary or whatever he's concerned with. But um, here I am kind of forcing him into a picture with Rudy because um, there's just this huge insistence on um, kids have to love animals, and especially autistic kids because they can't like interact with other kids, but they can relate to animals. And um, and of course, he's had some non-human animals who he has liked because they're all different, just like humans. Um, but for the most part, it's really uncomfortable for him. And um, but anyway, sometimes I. You know, just oh, do that anyway to make people happy. Here's the, here's the picture of him with an animal. Um, I a lot of times I have rejected it, and I'm proud of myself at least for that. Like they'll insist on him. He has to wear a costume for Halloween, and he has to go trick or treating. All kids love to do that. He hates that. He doesn't want to wear a costume. He doesn't. He can't even have most of the candy that's there, and he doesn't want to go up to people's porches. And I don't force him to do that. And so I've had to put my foot down a lot and. It's amazing how much resistance I've gotten from that. But anyway, um, here's me um, as a teacher. Um, I have middle school students. I teach the AVID program, um, which is a college preparatory program for underrepresented students. And I love it, and um, I feel like I've done a lot of good for my students. But here I am um, doing an award ceremony with them, uh, teaching them how to shake hands and get their awards and stuff. But I'm awarding them for their grades, their behavior, their attendance, their all the, all this, you know, that we've talked about this this morning, just all the stuff that school usually does. And um, which brings me to this question I always am asking myself, should I be preparing my kids for the world as it is or as it should be? Um, and I, I it's, I'm, so I'm going back and forth with that all the time and trying to figure out what, what can I do? What can I get away with with my administration? What, what's, <laughs> What's going to be, is there also this, like, there's also the, like, the racism of, you know, low expectations, you know, I have to be careful of that, too, and, um, and then same thing with, with Bodhi, and same thing with myself, like, should I force myself into the social situation that I despise, is it, you know, good or bad thing? So, anyway, these are questions in my mind. Basically, my whole presentation today is just questions I'm asking that I mostly don't have answers to. So, um, anyway, um, this is an, another thing, especially with Bodhi, like happiness versus high expectations. Um, and so with Bodhi, um, most of the world is telling me I need to have 
really high expectations for him. I need to do whatever I need to do to make sure he says hello and goodbye and please and, and all the basic social etiquette to make other people comfortable and make sure that he can do some job in the future and be as independent as possible and stuff. That's what a lot of people are telling me. My husband, on the other hand, um, does not, he basically just decided I want him to be as happy as possible. I'm not caring about anything else. I just want him to be happy in this moment. Um, and I keep going back and forth trying to figure out the right place to be with that and I mostly want him to be happy too and I, I don't care if, I don't really care if he was supposed to be Einstein and I don't allow him to do that because I kind of don't care if he does something for the rest of the world. I just want him to be happy. But it, remind, it reminds me of um, a family member when I was young said to me um, that they didn't want me to marry a person of another race, because not because they think there's anything wrong with it, but because they didn't want me to have to deal with the pain or the um, challenges that would come with that. They just wanted me to be happy. Um, so um, I think about that with Bodhi, like, um, am I really, you know, am I, am I helping him to be happy right now and not in the future? Is are you really happy if you're not challenging them? I, there's a million million questions and I don't have time to go into. How long have I been talking already? 11 minutes? Okay. So um, anyway, lots and lots of questions. Um, so, um, but an issue that comes up with ableism a lot is this uh, independence versus interdependence. And uh, this is just something I posted, I shared on Facebook the other day that somebody else posted and it's uh, pretty applicable to me.